We start, of course, uh, in Italian. Buonasera. È un grande onore di avere qui il rettore illustrissimo dell'Università di Torino. La sua ricerca include la giurisprudenza ed anche l'arte. Quindi è proprio perfetto per il Keta Hamburger Kolleg Recht als Kultur e sono sicuro che lei ci illumini. Man wartet in Konjunktiv. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to the forum event with Professor Dr. Gianmaria Ajani Ajani on Thursday uh, today um, at our center. Uh, your lecture is entitled Classic Law and Contemporary Art a Challenge. So my problem now is not to talk about the topic because it's so <laughs> fascinating uh, because I then will have a struggle with him because he wants of course to explain what the real problem is. Uh, so we are uh, uh, very glad and very feel very honored that uh, you as an internationally renowned expert on legal reforms, by the way in transition countries uh, of the former Soviet uh, Union and uh, some areas and we are very happy that uh, Marta Buchholz, a former fellow at our center, has joined us today for a discussion about the doctoral program law and culture as culture and whatever. Uh, that we discussed in the afternoon and you have been very much involved in that uh, field also very welcome to be with us today also uh, you have worked as an advisor to the IMF the Commission of the European Union the UNDP and the ILO so uh, you must know this is a man who knows what he speaks about uh, you are rector at the University of Turin since <coughs> October 2013 you said you had how many, how many months? Uh, six. six years. Uh, yeah, six years. So that means it is an extraordinary occasion to have you um, as a speaker uh, tonight. Uh, and uh, if you will uh, have the chance to talk with him and to, to, to chat, you will see how many calls he has to reject in order to be able to talk to you mm -hmm. in the same time uh, from all over the world. Um, he is a professor of law, teaching you uh, a private law, contracts law, uh, contract law, comparative private law, international law, if I see right, private international law, as we call it in Germany also. And uh, one of his uh, research areas is also the impact of legal reforms on economic performance uh, there have been in the early uh, or in the late 90s a lot of publications in this sense of economics and the law questions. Legal systems of transition states, especially in Eastern Europe, and law and language. And this is very interesting. Law and language, we didn't make so much a doubt about this because it's also very, very difficult. Uh, but uh, um, his work about multilingual conceptual dictionaries uh, based on ontologies uh, are dealing with the question uh, whether a kind of uniform terminology for European contract law, for example, uh, uh, is a necessity or not, or do we just remain forever in uh, lost in this horrible question of translation and translating and retranslating and so forth or, as I uh, um, uh, lastly said, uh, to be permanently and eternally embarrassed in translation. So the proposition would be another one, to, uh, to create another kind of universal language, if I understand right. This is a very interesting point, a topic for another talk, I suppose. So, uh, of course, it is not surprising that somebody with this background is invited all over the world. So you have been uh, a visiting professor at the University of California, Berkeley, at the Un Université de Fribourg in Switzerland, as well at the <coughs> universities of Wuhan in China and Hanoi, uh, by the way, uh, that is in Vietnam, as most of you know. <coughs> we have even somebody who speaks v Vietnamese at our center. Mm -hmm. So you must know, and she writes, and she, she's perfect. Vietnamese. 
Among um, the numerous publications, there can be found works on comparative law, Diritto Comparato, Casi Immateriali, with uh, Barbara P Paza, uh, Turino, 2013, as well uh, as on art law, and this is I Diritti dell'arte contemporanea. Uh, this is a fascinating book I can recommend for those who like to read about uh, questions of art law in Italian. It is, in any case, an interesting book for uh, you, Grishka. Um, other books uh, deal with um, Diritto dell'Europa Orientale. This has been translated into German, so there is also uh, a possibility to read Professor Ayani in German, Das Recht der Länder Osteuropas, translated in 2005. I have a lot to say about your topic, but we made a, a kind of an agreement that I will not try to make your talk. It is your floor. We are very honored uh, that you <coughs> are with us, and uh, we are very keen to know how you will treat this problem of modern art on the one side, conceptual art, different concepts of the art, and on the other side, this old-fashioned, horrible, and sometimes really boring system of the law. The floor is yours. Thank you and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I I'm really feel privileged to, to be here because uh, you managed to do something which is very difficult to, <coughs> to build up, which is to have a center where different disciplines and scholars and researchers gather on a common project, which is law and culture. Um, in fact, I've been uh, starting to work. I'm not an expert in art and law, I must confess. I've been doing that for the last four, five years, not no more. My real field is comparative law. And the good in comparative law is that it is a discipline without a field which is very much unlike uh, <coughs> criminal law or property law. If you teach pre property law, you have to teach what property law is about. You have to teach codifications in Germany or cases in England. If you teach criminal law, the same. Uh, if you teach comparative law, and in, we have in Italy the, a very lucky situation, comparative law is a mandatory course, second year, so every single student which uh, gets out from the law school had to take um, nine credits, meaning 60 hours in comparative law. Why I'm saying it's great? Because it is a way out from domestic contingent positive law and a way which goes and looks to the, I would say, contemporary reality and perhaps somehow to the future in a country where Roman law is still also a mandatory discipline in the first year. So comparative law is a, is a discipline without a field, and um, having chosen that fascinating uh, area, uh, and I chose that by chance. Uh, in fact, I got my dissertation in Soviet law because I, not because I was communist by the time it was the 70s, um, but it, because I had Russian language. Uh, so I entered uh, comparative law through Soviet law because of my language background, uh, which also says something uh, to you about my interest in, in law and culture. I have been working on law and culture for 30-something 30, 30 years in my academic career. So art and law is just one, the last aspect. Uh, but I have been working on language, multilingual uh, systems, meaning U European law. Uh, we did uh, good projects with the ICT people. I why ICT people? Because they are able to build semantic um, uh, products and we use that in order to create a multilingual semantic dictionary which is not a, some, something like the automatic translation which is ridiculous, not only in law but also in natural languages. <coughs> Then, because of Soviet law, I was called to, to, 
to work on legal reforms in China <coughs> and then in Vietnam. So things happen in life without too much um, strategy or planning, particularly if you are in a field without a discipline or a discipline without a field. Now, let's, let, let me come to the topic. I have two presentations, Fred, but we don't have too much time. So I can promise to have a second uh, venue, if you like, another time. The second is about um, contemporary art in, in public spaces, maybe what is called public art, legal aspects of and legal problems related to public art in public spaces. Uh, the one I want to, to discuss with you tonight is about mm, challenges brought in by contemporary law to contemporary art to classic law, particularly to a specific field in law which is private law. Uh, so it's not really about uh, copyright, because when we talk about art and law, the flash is on copyright. Uh, it's not only about copyright, it's rather about how contemporary art has changed in the last 25, 30 years, and how that change is challenging the classical frame which was built in order to govern um, art. <clears throat> now, in, in, in the tradition, the actors are pretty easily identifiable. Artist, in legal terms, the subject, the subject of the production of something, the something is the object, the artwork, and then places in the space where the object is deposited. Museums, public squares, collections, galleries. So in the following the classical frame, we have a subject, a legal subject, the author, producing something, could be a painting, could be a statue, and then transferring the artifacts to a possible buyer private collector, public collection, museum, whatever. Everything was very clear, everything was very framed. The same as paintings, which have been framed for centuries before getting out from the frame. <coughs> um, mm, easily said, art is a transnational phenomenon by nature. Visual arts are transnational. Music is transnational. Every expression of artistic creation is transnational. The problem is that the action made by artists, as well as the legal status of the artworks, is framed within national laws. So the classical approach, if we want to introduce our students to uh, which sources of law do govern the production of artworks, we have a set of sources of law, national copyright laws, every country <coughs> has, private law, property contrast torts, criminal law, censorship, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. You do not have criminal irresponsibility only because you are an author. There are some limits you cannot bypass. Administrative law, you cannot set a monument in a square without permissions. So these sources were the frame, the set of rules, uh, that lawyers and judges had at disposal for, I would say, at least 150 years. In, in that time, subjects, objects were clearly identifiable, there were no confusions, and <coughs> definitions, lawyers define, definitions were rooted into national laws. Then we have that uh, the first international uh, 
tool, which is the Berne Convention 1886. Think about 1886, Van Gogh was uh, painting. So it's quite a long time ago. How much art has changed in these 140 years? Uh, but law does not change so uh, quickly. So the Berne Convention for Protection of Literary and Artistic Works was designed and adopted in 1886, and the reason was that by that time, it was the first globalization, you know, uh, it was time where, in fact, there was huge demand for manufactured goods and art uh, within the civilized world, as they said by the time, end of the 19th century. Uh, they realized that there was too much diversity in national laws. So, uh, and being law a transnational phenomenon, there was a need for an international tool in order to provide um, a common legal background to the legal systems who decided, to the countries who had decided to adhere to, to, to sign the Berne Convention. <coughs> How does the Berne Convention define uh, what is art? It does not define what is art. <coughs> there is no definition uh, of what is art. There is no aesthetical value, there is no aesthetical judgment. But there is something which is a set of um, definitions which are supposed to be, by the time, quite trivial. It's a picture of what law was considered to be by the time. The expression literary and artistic works shall include every production in the literary, scientific and artistic domain, whether may be the mode or form of its expression. That is crucial. No concern about form of expression. He is not what it seems to be. is not a declaration of freedom. It is, on the contrary, a recognition of the incapability of the Berne Convention to define we will see that later on, on the, on the next point. And it covers literary and artistic works. For our purposes, I will be talking on, only about visual arts. We have works of drawing, painting, architecture, sculpture, engraving and lithography, photographic works to which are simulated works expressed by a process analogous to photography, the digital camera. Of course, that was changed later on. Not, that is not the original text, 1886. Uh, works of applied art, illustrations, maps, plans, sketches, <coughs> and three-dimensional works. Whatever may be the mode or form of its expression. So it seems from that, from that, Article 2.1, we get two informations. One is um, the fixation. Fixation is the term in order to understand how the idea has been deposited in a solid way. Fixation is not considered as a necessary element here. Secondly, we have a list, sculpture, lithographs, engraves, Photos, paintings, drawings, everything is very much material. And everything is very much uh, defined in a vertical way. Point number two, second item, article two, it shall be a matter for legislation in the countries of the Union. The Union is the, the, the set of countries who have signed the, the Berne Convention that works in general, or any specified categories of works, should not be protected unless they have been fixed in some material form. Why that? So, first statement, everyone is free. Second counter statement, uh, countries can mm, somehow deviate from point one um, and choosing or confirming that there is a need for fixation. That explains an uh, incapacity of those who discuss the convention to find an agreement. And the two positions were from one country, the common law countries, particularly the United States, and from the other side, the rest of the world, which by the time was mainly continental Europe. US law has been obsessed by protection of works. 
Uh, the Continental, which means French law, which was the ground for the legislation later on during the 19th century, on the contrary, was obsessed by the protection of the author. So in, in terms of American law, the moral rights of the authors were not an issue. That is, from the point of view of, of, of history of thoughts, interesting. American law was based on making, and the French law was based on the individual, the individu, the person holding rights, which had been already digested by American law later on. So under French and then German continental European law, the focus is on the moral rights of the author. And with that stress, fixation in some material form is not so relevant. The idea is the, is the, the object of um, European continental normative discourse. Uh, under American law, the objects, the artifacts, the, 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 the artwork. So, uh, discussing about ideas and fixation of the artwork in some material forms, we can put in other terms, idea versus facts. So the idea can be defined as a creative mental construct. I don't dare enter in that because there are too many um, philosophers in the, in the room tonight. Facts describe a set of constructs that do not owe their origin to an act of authorship. And facts, no question about, are uncopyrightable because they exist without human uh, action at all. So ideas are the main focus of copyright law, continental perspective. Idea, however, had, have to be recognized. And the question here is, is there a medium field or a medium place between the pure idea, which can be original and creative, but remains within my own sphere, and the solidification of the idea into a painting, a drawing, and whatever, is there something in between the two? The Burr Convention says yes, in a very vague terminology, which is form of expression. Now, critics to the Burr Convention. It leaves undecided how countries can regulate fixation. So in that sense, it's a poor product, because if it was designed, it was signed in order to provide uniform legislation, harmonization of the rules, it did not, having let aside one of the major issues, which is, shall we protect uh, for uh, the idea in any form of expression, or shall we protect an idea which had been fixed into a solid matter? Second, more interesting in terms of the purpose of my talk is, uh, the Convention does not uh, deal with the many challenges brought in by contemporary law in the last 25-30 years. Think to transformative art, to hybrid artworks, to the confusion between performance, theatre and sculpture, videos and movie in the sense of Hollywood architecture and ornament, digital self-production, automatic production of art by digital um, and software uh, programs, running themselves as an author, an independent author, contaminations, green rabbits manipulated on the DNA by the, who was the, Yes. So all these aspects, including conversations, artists producing conversations with you, and then 
selling the time you had with the artist, having heard the conversation and saying goodbye. Now you step away with your, the conversation in your mind, you have paid it, what did you buy? Where is the, <coughs> where is the fixation? Maurizio would say in the neurons of the brain. Um, so the contaminations and, and the, the transborder uh, action taken by artists in the last years are completely uncovered. They are left uh, undecided, uh, and that is um, that is one of the challenges contemporary art is bringing to the system of uh, international law. It's not only about the Berne Convention. It's not only about copyright law. If we go to the WTO, the World Trade Organization, which seems to be an, in, an organization very far from what art is. Uh, in fact, even within the WTO, we have agreements, the TRIPS, the Trade Related Intellectual Properties um, uh, agreements connected to the WTO. WTO is trying to, as you know, to promote globalization and international trade, um, cutting down os obstacles and, 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 and barriers <coughs> at, at, the, at the borders. So in the in the trade-related intellectual property um, protocol, Article 9.2, <coughs> copyright, the WTO said, copyright protection should extend to expressions and not to ideas, procedures, methods of operation, or mathematical concepts as such. So it's a definition by negative. Now, in that situation, we are left uh, somehow vague because of two reasons. One is the the the, the fact that Bern and the co national copyright laws are outdated, by, but they have not been renovated as necessary. Secondly, the vagueness of the Bern Convention on fixation versus any other forms of expression. So how, without, in that vague situation, how rules are defined? Well. Every time the system of positive rules is vague, uh, the judge has not free hand, but the judge has a duty to find the rule. So we are in a situation where the judge is, and that has been true for more than one century, from the end of 19 up to today, judges everywhere in the world have to decide what is art, what is not art what can be protected, what does not deserve protection because it has not been manifested uh, enough. And that has a lot to say and has a lot to do with law as culture. Because that means that um, different judges with different locations in a different part of the world will have an important say in de defining what is art. That is a first example of judges uh, brought in by ambiguity or lack of definition. Kohn's uh, had this um, work, Puppies, perhaps you are familiar with. There was um, a photographer in, uh, in, in, in the United States, his name is uh, Rogers, who took a black and white photo of a man and a woman with their arms full of uh, puppies, uh, little dogs. <coughs> Um, the photograph was entitled Puppies and was used on greeting cards and other generic merchandise. Very kitsch kind of postcard. Kunz uh, replied, so he took the photo on the postcard and made that in, 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 in um, pottery, in ceramic. Uh, and uh, he, in fact, appropriated the postcard and his work was a classical pop art uh, intervention. Uh, the problem is that Kunz was uh, sued by Rogers before a court. And <coughs> that sculpture was sold at 367,000, not bad. Um, and the photographer Rogers sued Kunz for copyright infringement. And he said, yes, I copied, but what is, what is wrong? 
I mean, art is made of moving on, using different materials, imitating, transforming, transforming, and transforming. Um, and he said, I am copying on purpose because my art is making a parody of something which is kitsch. That is my pop art. The judge found substantial similarity. Of course. <laughs> and the similarity was so close that the average lay person would recognize the copy. Very trivial, we, we can say. But that was the final decision. And on fair use, which is the, uh, the defense set forward by uh, cons um, councils, the judge rejected the parody argument. As Kunz could have constructed his parody of that general type of art without copying Roger's specific work. So he, that judge was really very much obsessed by protection of, uh, of the copyright, of the image. Um, so he lost the case. Rogers got a huge amount of money, plus, ironically, um, the last, f there were four copies of the sculpture. The last one was, was um, given to him as a mm, compensation. Now, that is um, another case. The first one, very <coughs> famous, where in fact um, judges were taken into the discussion on what is art. Bird in space. Yes, Bracuzzi uh, shifted about translation of phenomena, moving bird in space from France, from the cabinet of Bracuzzi in New York City for an um, expo uh, exhibit in a gallery in uh, 1928. Um, it was uh, packed, shipped, blocked at the custom uh, office by um, a very um, obedient and law-abiding uh, custom official, as they must be, uh, who uh, decided that that had to be levied in terms of um, custom duties. And he did reject the art exemption. It's quite common that countries have different rates for custom duties at the border, and it is quite common, even by that time, that art is <coughs> either excluded, so zero tax duties, or paying a lower, very much low um, uh, percentage. The, the custom, can you imagine a custom um, official in New York City at the harbor in 28? I think you can even yeah. sound the voice. <coughs> Irish accent. Yes. Are you pretending that is a piece of art? <laughs> I say, yes, it is. No, and he applied the um, kitchen um, tools. Uh, tax pressure, saying, well, what looks to me, it was, it was not like that, it was not so polished, and the basement, which is a stone, was in an envelope, in a crane, and the, the bronze was in another crane, so it looks to me a kitchen tool, so 28% of the custom duty. <coughs> Brancusi was uh, puzzled, but his art dealer made the case, and that was done on purpose. So they brought an appeal against the custom duty um, decision. They went in court, and if you have time, if you don't know the case, it's really, um, it's really something to read the, the case. Because the case is mainly a dialogue between the judge who is trying to understand whether that is art or not. And can you imagine a judge in New York City, 28, same kind of uh, spirit? And he sets comments all over the case, but at the end he decides that is art. Not because he likes it, on the contrary, he writes, I really, I'm disgusted. People say this is art. But he, he is a judge, so he says, I'm not applying my aesthetic judgment, because if I would do that, um, no way to win the case. But I've made investigations, I've called witnesses, and galleries, and art dealers from the lively uh, cultural uh, environment in New York City, and they do <coughs> confirm that uh, Brancusi is an artist. I have, uh, I have uh, heard to the witnesses, 
I read the catalogs, I saw the, the, the pictures, and understanding that Barcuzzi is an artist, I accept that what he says is art, is art. It's interesting, because he is not touching on the object, he is not discussing the, the nature, the aesthetical value of the object. He says, I believe people saying that he is an artist, um, even if I don't like, and if an artist says this is art, I must take that this is art. So, a very indirect way to define what is art through the nature of the author. <coughs> now, now a set of problems, that was a kind of introduction, a set of problems that we have in the confrontation between contemporary art and law. Originality has been set, perhaps you remember, in the Berne Convention as one of the elements, and that is even more stressed in national copyright law. So the author is protected as long as his her idea is original, something that has been very much challenged by Duchamp, where the originality changes its meaning. It's not anymore I done something which did not exist before. What is original here is not the object. On the contrary, what is less original than Gioconda four centuries later? The originality is on the, on the, on the movement. The ready-made is the deplacement or the displacement or the movement of an object which is put in a different context. So Duchamp challenged the very idea of originality which was incorporated in law, which had been incorporated in law, which was the real <coughs> reason to protect the author, because we praise originality, but it changed the meaning, the core of the concept of originality. Second challenge, appropriation. Like Kunz, we have a famous um, picture by, by photographer AP, Associated Press. The photographer is not very famous. AP is an agency which is famous. That was used by uh, Shepard Ferry, and it, it's difficult to deny the imitation. And that case was uh, 2006, something like that. <coughs> Again, the Associated Press accuses artist Shepard of copyright infringement, and they did not win simply because they settled the case, meaning that the artist paid quite a sum to Associated Press, who, hold, who was the holder of the rights on the, on the photography. It's interesting to note that quite a lot of litigation occurs uh, between people doing different um, things. It's not, it's, it is rare to find artists suing artists for appropriation. It is quite common to find photographers, even photographers who call themselves art photographers, suing um, painters or sculptors for appropriation. So the qualification of the, of the artistic value of the object rests on the judge. Many cases confirm that. Even if the famous Justice Holmes, one of the greatest figures of uh, uh, history of American law wrote, it would be a dangerous undertaking for persons trained only to the law to constitute themselves final judges of the worth of pictorial illustrations outside of the narrow west and most obvious <coughs> limits. Justice Holmes in the case Blinstein versus Donaldson. That is a very conservative statement because he says, let the art define itself and don't ask the judge to be the one who makes something which is not considered as art following the tradition to become art. 
And Justice Holmes, in fact, was pretty much conservative. So he said, there are standards. If the art is art following these standards, I respect that. Don't ask me to understand something which is not according to the standards. And here there is another quote from the Cour de Cassation, Paris. Le jugement de goût en ce qu'il a de purement personnel ne doit pas devenir le jugement de droit. La loi se méfie de l'arbitraire, de la subjectivité et de l'aléa. Pour autant, les critères pour juger l'œuvre ne sont pas purement objectifs. On sait que l'originalité est la marque de la personnalité de l'auteur. Voilà le French. La, on sait que l'originalité est la marque de la personnalité de l'auteur. That is the real, the, the, the synthesis of the French legal uh, thinking about, um, about the importance of the moral rights of the author, la personnalité de l'auteur. When we protect art, we don't protect the artwork, we protect the personality of the author. <coughs> Quant à l'exigence d'une forme, elle repose sur la thèse selon laquelle les idées seraient de libre parcours. Meaning, we do not protect pure ideas, because les idées sont de libre parcours. Uh, more problems. So the first problems related to originality, appropriation. Uh, as I mentioned already, commenting the, the Berne Convention, Article 2, the hybrid art uh, is not considered by the Berne Convention, which is organized vertically. Some examples of hybrid art. Difficult to put these definitions of hybrid art. You can draw that from that. I will leave the, the, the PowerPoint, of course. Um, Difficult to find these and the qualifications of hybrid art within to put that within the frame of the Berne Convention. They don't fit. That is the f one of the first products made automatically by a um, computer, 68. <coughs> now, back, uh, you remember the, the um, Berlin space, Bracuzzi case? That is a more recent case. Uh, then Flavin and Bill, uh, Viola, you know what they do, uh, light in space. So Bill <coughs> Viola makes mainly videos and uh, Flavin makes uh, neon tubes. That, that case is very uh, intriguing. 2010, five years ago, an international uh, gallery based in London and New York shipping uh, artworks by the two within cranes airport of London one of the many custom duties the cranes are opened the value declared is high because these offer us very much priced and the customer uh, official the customs official declares um, the exemption for arts is not uh, applicable here because we are in the front of um, electrical devices. That is what Bill Viola uses and that is what uh, Dan Flavin uses. Electrical devices, so the rate from United States into the European Union borders is high, 22%. The declared value is, let's say, 800,000, a huge bill. Based on the declared value, which seems quite odd, because if that is a tube, the value can be 30 euros. If that is flavin, it could be 300,000. But if you say it is a tube, I should pay 20% of 30 euros, not 20% of the 300,000. Right? But the point is that under tax law, as merchants are used to cheat and to, and to declare the value, which is a minor value than the actual one, under tax law, they apply 
the ratio, 20%, on the declared value. And here the declared value, formally speaking, it was correct, even it was logically absurd. Of course, the, the, the gallery, um, which is not Gagot, is Venison is the name of the gallery. The gallery um, resisted. They went in court. And then, uh, and then they, they, they won the case. Because it was recognized that was art. But that is not the end of the story. Six months later, the European Commission took a regulation <coughs> and in order to, to prove that the European Commission is a set of bureaucrats, difficult to put in another way, the Commission said in the regulation that um, these kind of uh, arts cannot be considered permanently as artworks. They are arts or it is artworks at intermittence, can you say that? So when they are in the space and you have the, the artwork because, and that was, I mean, from the point of view of, uh, of, an, uh, of art critique, it was correct because they say the, the artwork is not the beamer, the artwork is the light which is produced in the space, it's light sculpture, so when the beamer is off into a crane in the airport it is an electrical supply. Only when it is installed and it produces the result which is the light in space it is art. So that is the last, um, the last decision regulation taken by the, by the European Commission which has been commented and criticized of course widely. Other examples are very intriguing. Even if tax law is very boring, when you apply tax law to contemporary art, you have a funny result. And the result is funny because tax law classifications are so old and so outdated that you, you really cannot believe that they really maintain that approach. Uh, so for your further investigation, if you <coughs> Google the California tax law, which is on Google, and uh, sections uh, 6011.1 and 6012 revenue and taxation code that says what is considered to be art for tax purposes meaning for instance that if you if you expo if you have some art and you give that for more than 166 year, uh, days in a year on public um, exhibit, even in a private space like a general store, you can deduct half of the value from your um, tax uh, bill. Yes. It, it is a good idea. So you are, you are a private collector. You give to the municipal library, your, your cons for six months and one day, and you can deduct part of the value. But in fact, what is deductible? What, which kind of art is the object of that tax exemption? A list which is under 6011 says statues, paintings, uh, and other manufactured materials by the hand of the author, drawings in no more than eight copies. Now, the fact that there is a legislator still believing that contemporary artists do on their, with their hands art is ridiculous. So that excludes, in fact, contemporary art, particularly the art which does not Mm, and does not fit with the definition from tax deduction. In other words, tax codes in California is, is very much progressive in many sense, including law, uh, but not in tax law. So in that sense, uh, contemporary art is excluded from uh, the generosity of the legislator, which gives you a bonus if you um, offer to public um, 
public um, exhibit for a while. That is mm, not only California. You have the same in the, in the, in the French called des Impôts. <coughs> now, another problem. Uh, classic law is not able to deal with conceptual art. That is nice. Uh, Try to say I put that on my in my office because with colleagues it works. Try to say nothing. Try to say nothing negative about anybody, which is a typical vice for academicians to say something very negative about everybody for three days, for forty-five days, for three months, and see what happens to your life. <laughs> and and the author is Yoko Ono. Uh, 1996. So, <coughs> what, what is the object? It's not that piece of paper. But it is what, what happens in your life. Difficult, difficult to grasp in legal terms. The same for that one. Buy many dream boxes, ask your wife to select one and dream together. So, it's an instruction to perform. So what, what, what do you buy? That is an idea which is not fixed into that paper. It is only an instruction to do something, or perhaps you can do it, you can. And that is another one. It's, uh, I think that is Utterlo in uh, Netherlands, the Contemporary Art Museum. Sun piece, watch the sun until it becomes square. That is also difficult to perform. Or Lawrence Wiener using words. On purpose, he's challenging law because he's using public common goods like words, and they d they become piece of authorship protected, not because of that statement. I can write as far as the eye can see without infringing any copyright. So the, the space of imitation is reduced. It's not anymore the image as such, but it is the context. Where that has been exposed, how big the characters are, and Wiener works in order to challenge copyright law. He said, people buy my stuff, can take it wherever they go, and can rebuild it if they choose. I'm not interested in protecting my production. If they keep it in their heads, that is fine too. No fixation. They don't have to buy it. They can have it just by knowing. Anyone making a reproduction of my art is making art just as valid as art as if I had made it. So it's a kind of denial, a denial which, legally speaking, is not admitted because moral, moral rights in uh, continental Europe cannot be renounced. You can transfer the, the economic results of the exploitation of your art, but you cannot transfer your moral rights the same as you cannot change your personality. <coughs> Another problem, the progressive dismantling of the identity of the subject, and that is a nice example, which is Gonzalez Torres, 80 kilos of um, cookies. His weight was 80 kilos, he died out of HIV, and people are requested, that is uh, modern Tate in London, are requested to pick up the, the, the candies and to eat. And after one week of exhibit, um, there is nothing there. But the, that means that two, two solutions. Temporary art, finished, expired. No, this is not he, what he wanted. He wanted to remain, even if he died. So the certificate which was sold to modern Tate said every time 
there are no candies left, Modern Tate has the right to build in that particular shop at the corner the same quantity, 80 kilos of candies, to be reinstalled and the process starts again. First, we, we see that contemporary art needs to be explained because nobody can understand what is the, what is the idea there if you don't know it. Secondly, <coughs> the property is not 80 kilos of cookies. The property is a piece of paper where Gozai Torres gave the instruction to the buyer and in that case the buyer is the modern Tate, which holds in a, in a cave the certificate, which is the idea in order to activate the process. Another set of problems, that is a website, we don't have to, time to go through that, is, is temporary art. Temporary art is more and more practiced. Um, artists leave on purpose what they have done on open air, they expose to rain and, 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 and snow, so that the, the, the artwork changes and eventually disappears. And that is problematic in terms of administrative law because an art a, a museum curator has the duty to maintain and to keep safe and protected the property of the museum. Here we have a conflict between what the artist wants, destruction, and what the law says in terms of the duties of a museum, public, particularly public museums. Um, and that has to be managed. The idea which was in classic art was that art is forever. And we, we find that again in my second presentation, which is public art. So contemporary art in public space has moved from perpetual monuments into um, temporary public art, which is very much contrasted by the law because the classic law says we can accept public spending in operas and theater performances. We know that that, that is for one, one evening, one night, and that is over. But nobody complains on the fact that public money is spent for something which does not last. But if you spend the same public money in temporary monuments or in arts, in public museums, which is supposed to disappear because that is what the artist wants, that is somehow uh, tricky. And then we have problems with, that is, in contemporary art, that is a classical problem, what you can do and what you cannot do to your body uh, in terms of mm, uh, self, um, how can I say that? Not destruction, but... Consumption. Huh? Consumption. Yes. And uh, so, closing. Uh, Contemporary art has challenged all over the 20th century this classical set of rules out of natural evolution, in a sense, or and out of um, intended uh, challenge by the artists themselves, who wanted to go over the set which had been mm, provided by uh, classic rules. Um, that means that contemporary law is not um, able anymore <coughs> to, to regulate. And the, the proof, the evidence, is in the, the quantity of litigation which comes out. So the more we measure litigation going and in, 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 in increasing, the more that means that there is something which does not work with the system of rules. People litigate because rules are not clear. People litigate because rules are outdated. Uh, people litigate because uh, rules cannot govern a change which happened in society, particularly in uh, that field which is very much uh, fast, which is contemporary art. Thank you. I'm very much pleased to receive your uh, comments and, and questions. Thank you.